Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Planetarium show. Um, my name is Jessica. I am the director of the Planetarium, uh, and with me tonight is a familiar face, one of our students. I'll still let them say hi and introduce themselves. <laughs> Hello, my name is Brayden. I'm a vocal music head major here at UMD. So um, tonight we are wrapping up Women's History Month with yet another uh, history show, this one about space flight and the amazing woman who helped make that possible. Um, quite frankly, spoiler, couldn't have done it without them, but we'll see more about that. Uh, now, as always, if you have any questions throughout the show, feel free to leave them down in the comments. Uh, Brayden's going to be keeping an eye on that for me. Will let me know if questions come up. Um, I'm also going to preemptively apologize because my computer had a minor freakout before we went live. So hopefully I have everything fixed. But if something weird happens, I'm just pre-warning you. All right. Now I have to remember what I'm doing. And how to do this. I know how to do this. It's definitely not my first time. There we go. <laughs> okay. Um, so for any of you who have been watching our streams for a couple years now, um, you may recognize this show. It was made by Lindsay, one of our past previous, one of our past previous, oh my goodness, one of our previous um planetarium students as uh, she has since graduated and is off doing bigger and better things but um uh since it is women's history month i always like bringing these out so um yes this is Lindsay's show that i am reviving um and yeah i may stumble a little bit more than she did because she made the show but i'm just gonna get into this let's get going okay no wrong button that button all right. Um, so we're going to start off with the Rocket Girls, um, who were many of the women helping with the rocket program at the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, so here is a picture of many of the Rocket Girls. Um, now, for a lot of this, um, the Jet Propulsion Laboratory actually started out with uh, missiles. Um, and then after the end of the war, they started trying to work on um, using that missile technology to become rockets to you know, help us leave the Earth. Um, and in that process of helping out with this, there were many women who worked there. Um, many of them did not have college degrees because women didn't, weren't really allowed to go to college. Um, but what they ended up doing is calculating so much of the information needed for these rockets, such as how much thrust was needed, um, calculating the trajectories that the rockets would take. And all of this, again, is before we had computers. So they were doing all of this by hand, figuring out everything that we needed, um, all the information we needed to launch these rockets. Um, and so they are commonly referred to as the human computers because... Well, that's exactly what they did. Um, so at first, uh, we had the Jupiter-C rocket that was in development um, by JPL. Um, at the same time, the Navy was doing the Vanguard project. Um, and that was the one that was actually chosen for by the government to, you know, start building these rockets um, to get us out into space. Unfortunately, though, the Vanguard project didn't work, um, but JPL kept working on the Jupiter-C rocket, um, kind of in secret. And so when Vanguard failed, um, JPL was able to be like, hey, we have ours working. Uh, and so they became kind of the center for rockets and jet propulsion, hence their name now being the Jet Propulsion Laboratory. Um, so we're going to look at a few of the women who worked at JPL. Um, first up is Marcy Roberts. This is her right over here. Or Macy Roberts, I apologize. Um, she was actually a supervisor of many of the women human computers. Uh, next up, we have Barbara Paulson. Um, she started in 1948 uh, and worked at JPL for about 45 years. Um, this is actually a picture of her getting her 10-year, um, kind of her 10-year pin for working there. 
Um, and she did a lot of different things, including calculating um, trajectories and necessary stuff for the Mariner probes, which were some of the first spacecraft to actually fly through the solar system, um, and went and visited Venus and Mercury. And she also was essential in the Viking spacecraft as well. Uh, next is Janez Lawson, who is right here. Um, she was the only woman and the only black person in her engineering class. Um, unfortunately, she could not get a job as an engineer. Uh, so when she saw an ad for human computers at JPL, she applied and got the job. Um, and she became essential in, in doing all of the work that JPL did. Uh, next is Sylvia Lundy. She actually plotted the courses for the two Voyager spacecraft. Um, so again, plotting these tra trajectories, calculating these tra trajectories completely by hand. Um, but what she also did was figured out how to use Jupiter and Saturn to have a gravity assist to sling Voyager 2 out to Uranus and Neptune. All of these calculations by hand and this incredible mission, in fact, the only mission that has visited Uranus and Neptune, she calculated the trajectories for and calculated what was needed to make those gravity assists happen. It still just blows my mind. Uh, next up is Sue Finley, um, who last we checked uh, at 80 something years old was still working at JPL. Um, she worked on the Mariner programs in the 70s. In the 1980s, she worked on the Deep Space Network. Um, she states that her favorite mission was Venera, which is one of the um, spacecraft that uh, landed on Venus. Um, and her most recent project is Juno, which is currently orbiting around Jupiter right now. All right, moving on, we are going to talk about the Mercury 13. Um, these were a group of women who were in hopes of being um, some of the first astronauts uh, to leave Earth and go to space. Um, unfortunately, though, they never made it into the astronaut program. Um, so I have a little video here that's going to talk more about that. While the Americans were recruiting astronauts, the Soviets continued to rack up firsts in space. In 1963, they launched Valentina Tereshkova, their first female cosmonaut. She flew 48 orbits. the Lovelace Clinic in New Mexico, a top secret program was underway to recruit a core of female astronauts. They were dubbed the Mercury 13. Well, they did extraordinarily well in the tests and they surpassed the men in some ways. And uh, that was a function of their uh, different body type. And they wound up with uh, 20 or so ladies that were all suitable candidates. And of those uh, 20 or 24 that took the tests, 13 were found to be adequate and appropriate candidates for the space program. It didn't happen because they were 20 years ahead of their time. The program never received any kind of encouragement from NASA. In fact, uh, active steps were taken to quash it. And so the ladies, ladies who had been given tremendous stimulation and they were all very excited about being astronauts and everybody at Lovelace thought they were gonna be astronauts were suddenly told that they couldn't be. Jerry Cobb and her team were ready and eager to fly when the program was suddenly halted. No explanation was ever given to them, although the orders apparently came from the highest level. I've seen a copy of a memo from Vice President Lyndon Johnson in which he uh, was requiring uh, James Webb to look into the suitability of women as candidates for space 
and in Lyndon Johnson's handwriting across the bottom, instead of a signature, was the phrase, let's put a stop to this now. And that apparently was the death knell of the Mercury 13's aspirations to go into space. Most of them never knew about this till years later, but, and they never gave up. To this day, they uh, still are looking for a ride. They want to go in space. There's no difference in capability of, of pilots, whether women or men. But the problem was there were no women with experience in research and development. So you pick the guys with experience in research and development, and that, that's just a smart way of doing it. Valentina Tereshkova would be the last woman in space until Sally Ride boarded an American space shuttle two decades later. By the end of 1963, the total number of astronauts had risen to 30. They'd all be vying for the 20 available seats on Gemini. All right, so it's glossed over just a little bit. Um, and that, you know, they said that they picked for astronauts the people who had, the pilots who had experience in research and development. The issue there is that women weren't allowed to have jobs in research and development. So, of course, there weren't any women that had experience in that. Um, but that is the reason they gave, despite, as you saw, a lot of these women being very capable and eligible of being able to do this but um so that is the mercury 13. um moving on now to the apollo missions and the hidden figures at nasa um if you've seen the hidden figures movie then you probably know about many of these amazing women um i still have to call myself out and say that i still haven't watched it i know i need to i know i need to um, but to start us off, we are going to talk about Dorothy Vaughn, Katherine Johnson, and Mary Jackson. So Dorothy Vaughn, um, was a mathematician and one of the human computers who worked at NASA, um, to help with the Apollo program and other missions as well. Um, when computers were actually introduced, she knew that there was, uh, a chance that her job was going to be in jeopardy. So she actually taught herself how to use the computer and how to program and then taught all of the other women computers um, that same knowledge so that they would continue to have a job and could continue their work on the computers rather than doing it by hand. Um, Katherine Johnson did some incredible incredible work. I actually think I have another picture of her. Yes. Um, some incredible work um, with calculating trajectories and stuff. And in fact, her work was so well trusted that when computers were introduced, they actually had Katherine Johnson check the computer to make sure that the computer was doing it correctly. That's how much they trusted her and her work. Um, she received the Congressional Medal of Honor in 2015, um, and in 2019, a research facility um, at NASA was named after her, um, and she lived to the ripe old age of 101 before sadly passing on. Uh, and then we have Mary Jackson, um, another one of the hidden figures there who worked at NASA, or, yeah, at NASA. Um, and again, we have another NASA building named after her. Uh, this one was dedicated back in 2020. Um, next, we have Margaret Hamilton, who pretty much created the job of software engineer. Um, she is responsible for all of the code and onboard flight software that the Apollo missions used. In fact, this is her standing there next to all of the code that she wrote. Um, and again, her work was very well trusted that if she hadn't said so, um, we may not have actually had the first landing on the moon. Um, so I'm going to actually play this video and let her tell you a little bit more about that. They announced that they were looking for people 
to do programming to send man to the moon. And I just thought, wow, <laughs> I've got to go there. <laughs> I grew up in the Midwest, Indiana, Ohio, Michigan, Upper Peninsula. I just enjoyed school, but there was something about math that I just liked more than everything else. I liked deriving the answers because I didn't want to memorize. It was too much. <laughs> I was lazy. <laughs> My husband was in law school. They wanted the law wives, my being one of them, to pour tea. And I said to my husband, no way am I pouring tea as a Harvard law wife. If I go to Harvard law school, fine, I'll do what the men do, but I'm not going to be put in that position. And he was very proud of me that I had taken that stand. announced that they were looking for people to do programming to send man to the moon. I was the first programmer they hired. I came up with the term software engineering, and it was considered a joke. What? Software is engineering? <laughs> Mostly men were working there, and they had somebody at home to take care of their kids. I had no choice. I'd bring my daughter, Lauren, into work nights and weekends, and she'd see me playing astronaut to test the software and doing the kinds of things the astronaut would do. So she wanted to do it, too, so she played astronaut. And all of a sudden, everything came crashing on the simulator, and I realized that what she had done is that she selected the pre-launch program during flight. I said, oh my God, this is not good. We really need to put a protection in there because the astronaut really could do what she did by mistake. I tried to get it through MIT, NASA. No, they said, astronauts are trained never to make a mistake. There was an emergency. Everything happened that we thought would happen if they made the mistake. So then there was a decision, go, no, go, land or don't land. Fortunately, the people at Mission Control trusted our software, and they said, go, go, go. The software and the hardware worked perfectly. The software was on the ground <laughs> and on the moon. That's one small step for man, one Her example speaks of the American spirit of discovery that exists in every little girl and little boy who know that somehow to look beyond the heavens is to look deep within ourselves. Being fearless, even when the experts say, no, it doesn't make sense, they didn't believe it. Nobody did. It was something that we were dreaming of happening, but it became real. <laughs> Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I don't know how many times I have seen this video, I still get chills and teary-eyed every time. Um, this woman is amazing and definitely one of my idols. Um, but there are more to talk about. Um, so also working on the Apollo mission was Joanne Morgan. Uh, she was actually in Mission Control, one of the only women um, to be in Mission Control. Um, she was the instrumentation controller for Apollo 11. Um, 
And she thankfully had a supervisor who stood up her who stuck up for her because she did deal with a lot of misogyny being in mission control um a lot of little rude remarks of you know go get me coffee and all the stuff that women experience even still today um she had a supervisor who stood up for her and you know told these men off and allowed her to thrive in her position in her career um puppy north cuts was actually the first woman to serve as an engineer for NASA's Apollo program and was the only woman in mission control during the Apollo 8 mission. Uh, Ethel Bauer was a mathematician who worked in aerospace engineering um, and she her job was to help calculate the flight trajectories for the various missions to and around the moon, um, including the return back of the Apollo 13 mission, which um, as I feel like it's not as common knowledge anymore, but Apollo 13 um, had a big disaster on their way to the moon where one of their oxygen tanks exploded. Um, and so people at NASA had to work really hard to figure out how to get them back home safely. And uh, she was one of those that helped with that. Uh, Margaret Bernanke was actually a metallurgist who became the first female welding engineer at NASA. Um, and so she used her knowledge of aluminum alloys uh, to make uh, critical decisions about the materials that were used in various uh, spacecraft and designs um, for NASA. Uh, Barbara Johnson was an aeronautical engineer tasked with bringing Apollo astronauts home safely. Uh, so she helped with the return trip from the moon back to the Earth. Billy Robertson was also a mathematician, um, and she worked on calculating the thrust of the rocket engines and also helping with uh, creating the trajectories needed for the rockets. Judy Sullivan was the first woman engineer in spacecraft operations. Um, she was also the engineer for the biomedical systems of Apollo 11. So basically the sensors and stuff that the astronauts wore so that people at Mission Control could, you know, know that they were healthy and alive. Um, she helped with creating all of those sensors and the programs um, and monitoring the vital signs of the astronauts. All right, moving on to when women did finally get into space themselves. Um, as we saw in the first video clip, uh, Valentina Tereshkova was the first woman in space back in June of 1963. Um, she still to date is the youngest woman to have traveled in space at the age of 26 um, and is the only woman to have made a solo space flight. Um, Svetlana Savitskaya was the first woman on a space station and the first woman to do a space walk and the first woman to do two space flights. Uh, now, both of them were Russian astronauts or cosmonauts, uh, but getting to the first American astronauts and um, American astronaut achievements, uh, Sally Ride was the first American woman in space back in June of 1983. Um, Catherine Sullivan was the first American woman to perform a spacewalk in October of 1984. Shannon Lucid was the first Chinese-born woman in space and the first woman to do at least three space flights. Uh, Millie Hughes Fulford was the first female, female payload specialist. Eileen Collins was the first female space shuttle commander. Uh, Peggy Whitson is the oldest female spacewalker. Um, she did that at the age of 47. Um, and as of April 24th, 2017, she had the longest cumulative amount of time in space by any NASA astronaut, man or woman, um, totaling 665 days. And she was the eighth um, longest cumulative amount of time for all astronauts around the world. 
Um, Kristen Cook has the record for the longest span of time spent in space, spending um, consecutive 328 days up on the International Space Station. Uh, she was also involved in the first all-woman spacewalk that happened at the space station. Seeing Jessica Meir make a not her first step or her first float out of the uh, out of the hatch there. Hello, United States. Congratulations, Christina and Jessica, on this historic event. What you do is is really something very special. So first the moon and then we go to Mars. For us, it's just coming out here and doing our job today. We were the, we were the crew that was tasked with this assignment. At the same time, we recognize that it is a historic achievement. And we do, of course, want to give credit to all of those that came before us. There have been a long line of female scientists, explorers, engineers, and astronauts. And we have followed in their footsteps to get us where we are today. Go women! And it just so happens that we have the right people doing the right job at the right time. And in fact, this is historic because those two right people are women. It's been 100 years that we've had the right to vote this year. So this year, while we celebrate that, we also check another box, women doing spacewalk. And the next one, the big one, is for us to walk on the moon. Milestone. It symbolizes exploration by all that dare to dream and work hard to achieve that dream. We hope an inspiration to all future explorers. Um, and from here, looking forward, um, we of course have the Artemis mission that is getting um, people back to the moon. And many of the Artemis astronauts are in fact women. So with the Artemis mission, we will have uh, the return of men to the moon and the first woman to walk on the moon, which I am incredibly excited for. Um, so with that, uh, I'm going to leave you with this here. This is several of the books and resources that Lindsay used when creating this presentation. Um, it has uh, this information and a lot more all about um, the Rocket Girls, the Mercury 13, and the Hidden Figures, all of those amazing women. Um, so with that... I will switch us back. Actually, actually, hold on. I forgot that I was going to do this. Um, I'm going to completely change the gears for just one second because if you didn't know, um, last week we had an incredible Aurora display that took place um, here in... Um, here, actually extended, I think I've heard as far south as Texas, as people were seeing this Aurora display. Um, but our All Sky camera up at the Chickwalk Museum and Nature Center got a spectacular view. Um, and I wanted to share that with you all. So here is the time lapse video from that evening. It's just whole sky, like, and I really even say, um, we, we went out, I got to see, this was my first time ever seeing the Aurora. Um, it was honestly better than I thought it would be. Um, it was magical, which sounds so corny, but it absolutely was. It was really active too. It was yeah. crazy. I wish I could have gotten to see it, but it's, I don't know. I learned about it too late, and it just didn't work out, which was a bummer. 
I know I didn't think about texting you guys until like it was pretty late. <laughs> but I was just enjoying it myself. <laughs> All right. Um, and the, the cool thing is too, though, that we are hopefully going to have more and more of that coming up. Um, because the sun is heading into uh, the maximum of its activity cycle, um, excuse me, which means that we should have more aurora displays like that in the next few years, which I am so excited for. All right, well, um, did we end up with any questions? Nope. All right. Well, if you do have any questions, now is a good time to put them down in the comments. Um, and while we wait for that, let me tell you what we've got coming up this week. Um, so Friday's show is going to be Adventure to the Edge of the Universe. Um, and Saturday, we are not doing our regular programming. Oh, no, no. That is because Saturday is Astronomy Day. Um, it's going to be taking place from 6 to 9 p.m. at the Planetarium. We are going to have planetarium shows, activities, telescope viewing, if the weather holds out. We've got some incredible raffle prizes. Um, it's going to be a great day. Um, so much fun. Um, so, yeah, if you are sad over the snow that's going to happen over the next two days, come enjoy cool, awesome astronomy and space things with us on Saturday. It's going to be a great time. Uh, and then you can join us back here on Facebook Live next Wednesday for What's Up April Edition, because April starts on Saturday. <laughs> It's crazy. I I'm, I don't like it. <laughs> I don't like it. I feel like I say the same thing every month, but I mean it's true. Like I I don't I don't know yeah. how it's already uh, April. Semester's almost over. Yeah, it's I'm crazy. Over. I don't like it. I don't like it. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I'm not seeing any questions, so I think we will wrap it up there. Uh, thank you everyone so much for joining us. If you're in the Duluth area, please come by Saturday for Astronomy Day. Um, otherwise, we will see you again next time. So have a good week, everyone. Bye. <laughs>